Margaret didn't tell you two important things. The first important thing is I asked her not to do all that nonsense of a formal introduction. <laughs> I think that the formal introductions are often about somebody's ego, and mine isn't that fragile today, so. <laughs> and I also have a theory about formal introductions. I, I believe that probably 98% of you don't care where I've been. <laughs> and you don't care what I've done. You're thinking to yourselves, is this broad going to have something that I can use tonight? Okay? And my commitment is to try to give you something that you can use. And the remainder of you who do care where I've been and what I've done have already been on my website. So you already know. The other thing that Margaret didn't tell you that is cracking me up inside is, this is what I had on yesterday. <laughs> and this, we don't know this. <laughs> and this afternoon, when I saw her, I thought, she looks just like a lady from yesterday. And then I thought it couldn't possibly be, but it really was. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, it registered. This is what you had on yesterday, you idiot. <laughs> This is like one of my favorite outfits in the world. <laughs>
get it at any level? Can you? Can you get it or have it at any level? Anybody else? Any other things that you're curious about related to strength-based leadership? Things that you want to know? Those are definitely things that we can and will address. If you think of other things, raise them. Because I'm happy to, if I don't have the answers, to direct you to some resources that will be useful for you. We are going to define it in just a little bit, but I want to give you the foundation first. Anybody in here familiar with emotional intelligence? Just raise your hand if you are. <laughs> okay. Quite a few people. So I'm just going to put this in a nutshell. There is a man by the name of Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, who is a scholar who teaches in Harvard's Business School and writes a lot for Harvard Business Review. And he is considered the father of emotional intelligence. And what he says is this, that you can have stellar intellect. You can be an absolute genius and not excel in your career. And that the reverse is true. That you can have just average or even less than average intellect and so on. He says that the distinction is this concept called emotional intelligence. And what it's about is how well we motivate ourselves, it's about that intrinsic motivation, how well we persist in the midst of the frustrations that we can't avoid. Because as you get up every day and breathe, there are going to be frustrations. The reason I have on the same outfit two days in a row is because the suit I tried on wouldn't zip. <laughs> we talk about frustrated. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's really about how we compose ourselves how we control ourselves. Now, Goldman goes further and highlights four components of emotional intelligence. <clears throat> the first one is self-awareness. Self-awareness asks one simple question. How well do I know me? How well do I know me? With all of my warts, with all of my faults, how well do I really know me? Am I deeply wedded to a fantasy about me? Or do I really know myself? You know we all have fantasies. You're laughing over there. You're wedded to your fantasy. <laughs> I like some of my fantasies about me. <laughs> uh, so it really is about how well do I know me. The second component is this thing called self-management. And that asks, if I know me, how well do I use the strengths and the gifts that I have? How well do I control myself in the workplace? Has anybody had the misfortune of working with one of these people? You come in in the morning, you're happy, you're upbeat, and you say good morning, and they say, I haven't had coffee yet. <laughs> and you know you want to say, choke on that coffee. <laughs> oh, you know that's what you want to say. <laughs> or have you ever had the misfortune of having the boss who doesn't speak in the morning uh -huh, because they come in with a tood and you want to say, take it back home to your husband. He gave it to you. Uh-huh. Yeah. But you can't say those things because it's impolite in the workplace. But you can say it here, okay? <laughs> you can say it to me because I know how you feel. <laughs> well, what that is an indicator of is a lack of the capacity to really self-manage. It's really about a lack of, how many pictures are you going to take now? <laughs> Good Lord! I'm going to look the same in all of them. <laughs> and I'm going to need a Photoshop 10 years off. <laughs> and 10 pounds. <laughs> so really, this self-awareness and this self-management is about getting a grip on you getting a grip on you. <laughs> I do a lot of consulting work with a wide variety of organizations, and one of my observations is this. Often 
you will see a department that has incessant turnover, and people try to figure out what's wrong. And I will say, look at the leader. Look at the leader. Something's wrong at the top. Fish start riding up the head, not at the tail. You heard that yesterday. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So if nobody can work with you, there's a problem with you. And so as we start to really think about this whole notion of strength-based leadership, it is important for us to come to a clear understanding of who I am and how I am. Now, I'm going to take a break from the four uh, components for just a second to, to illustrate something that's really important about those first two. I have a great niece whom I dearly adore. Her name is Kaya Simone Douglas. And she is 12 now. We're Instagram friends. Well, we used to be Instagram friends. I sent her an early morning post that she didn't like, and she stopped following me. Uh, she said, my friends can't see you with curlers in your hair, Aunt Jo. Uh, so. But when Kaya was about three and a half or four, we spent Christmas in North Carolina where they live. The whole family descends on their house. And Kaya had, and still has, this head full of curly, nappy, wild kind of hair. It's just a, a, a mix between curls and waves and naps and just everything. <laughs> and her mom, my niece, is not a good hair doer. So Kaya always had these big old afro puffs that were bigger than her little tiny head. <laughs> well, I have a sister who is, if you look up glamorous in the dictionary, you're going to see my sister. She gets up at 5 o'clock every morning to be sure that there are no chips in her nail polish, her feet, or her hands. She plans her wardrobe a week in advance and tries every outfit on. She lays out the jewelry to go with the outfit, okay? So she's always perfect. So here's my little Kaya with her Afro puffs gone wild, sitting on my lap, Christmas Eve, coloring. We're coloring and coloring. She's sitting and coloring, I'm coloring. And my sister says, Kaya, would you please let Aunt Judy comb your hair? And she just says, no, thank you. <laughs> she keeps coloring. And Judy says, Kaya, don't you want a nice hair? No, thank you. <laughs> color, you know how to color with that one hand, scribble back and forth? Well, the third time, Jeannie says, Kaya, please let Aunt Jeannie comb her hair. Can I put her crayon down? Aunt Jeannie, make your own hair do. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the crux of this. We will often look at these four components and think, you know what? Deidre needs to work on her self-awareness. You know what? Margaret really needs to do something about her self-management. But in fact, as we begin this journey, it's about making your own hair do. Really deciding to determine for yourself what is it that I need in terms of my own growth. I want to move on to the second two components of emotional intelligence. Self-management leads to this thing called social awareness. This is the understanding that we're not all the same. That the workplace is comprised of many different people. That diversity is inherent in our workplace today. Now, Sometimes when people hear a six foot, 110 pound black girl start talking about diversity, they get nervous and think, oh, she's about to go off on that race tangent. They do it all the time. <laughs> well, in fact, she's not. And if you really understand diversity, what you understand is that it is far more than race and gender. What you understand is that it encompasses, now who didn't hear me about the electronic things that I don't want to hear in my session? Turn that mess off. <laughs> you were trying to turn off and then they started talking. <laughs> that happened to me in church. <laughs> so diversity is really about a whole panorama of difference. It includes things like age, 
like sexual orientation, like where you were born, when you were born, how you were born, those kinds of things. When we understand diversity, we understand it includes things like your politics, like your life's sorrows and losses, like whether or not you have served in the military, those kinds of things. <laughs> Yeah, OK, I'm just going to Photoshop me to look 25. <laughs> Whether or not you served in the military and what you took from that service. So this idea of social awareness is really about broadening our scope and understanding how complex the work world is and understanding what that complexity means for me as a leader, understanding that we're not all the same. We don't all want to be the same. We should not all be the same. Tying this in to this notion of strength-based leadership, what social awareness enables us to look at are, what are the strengths that different members of my team have? What do they bring to the table that I don't have? If I have surrounded myself with clones of me, I have done myself and the organization a huge disservice. The fourth and, and final component of emotional intelligence is social skill. This is about how well I engage people. Can I get people excited about coming to Columbus? I have to tell you, when she stood up, I thought, Columbus. Now, who in the right mind is going to Columbus? <laughs> <laughs> After I heard about the zoo, one of my things every July is I have Kaya for the month, and she's a zoo fanatic. So we've been to the Toronto Zoo, the Washington Zoo, the Baltimore Zoo, the San Diego Zoo. We go to zoos all around the country. So this summer, we're going to go see this Columbus Zoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Entitlement. Entitlement. Who feels entitled to what? 
He's entitled to the world. To the world, not just the job, but to the world. Well, no, to the job. <laughs> what else is going on? Anybody have a different take? Yes. To the lack of self-awareness. Lack of self-awareness. Mm-hmm. What else? What else? Other things that you think? Whoa, 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 whoa. What, I, what do you mean a lack of self-awareness? Help me. Well, May I do that? Yes, you can do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, Bring it on, Bring it on, B. Can I do that after it's done, B? <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason we thought she, she's lacking some self-awareness is, is everything she's talking about in here is other people have come to her and said, hey, here are some areas where you might need a little help in learning. And she said, no, 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 they're telling me I did it. they're filling their heads with wrong stuff. And it might be time for her to look at herself and realize the fact that she doesn't like to delegate to anybody else, the fact that she wants to do everything, she's probably not in line with the corporate vision um, and what, what really needs to be done and doesn't see the big picture. So I think from that aspect, she's not really self-aware of, of really what's going on. All right, somebody else. Yes, and then yes. <laughs> I think it's also important to note that um, the sentence where it says that uh, she's not excited about what they're telling her, it's also coming from the leadership. There are some changes that need to be made above her in the way that they're seeing the way that she feels about it to help her feel differently. Okay. Yes, I saw a hand up over here. And I would add that besides self-awareness, I think it's all for component of this person's needs uh, improvement in because not self-managing and growing beyond the, the position that they currently have. Social awareness to actually recognize that I might not actually get this job. Uh, if you're with a company for 10 years and you can't get the social cues that you actually may not be the person that they're going to choose, is that's a lot of awareness that I don't think. And the social skills to actually either you know propel yourself with working, with delegating with others, or just actually um, having that that strategic level to be a Okay. And she likes to work in a she likes to work. Yeah, she said, I like working so well. Yeah. Yes and yes. I've got to wonder, being there 10 years, I've got to wonder who's been managing this person for 10 years. Yeah. Who has not been managing this person for 10 years? Yeah. All, all yeah. That, I said, who keeps promoting her? <laughs> when they keep telling her that they want her to do all this stuff, they keep promoting her up. <laughs> Without now, come on, tell the truth. How many of us have worked with people who got promoted to get them out of our hair? How many of us have <laughs> given Thanks good referrals to get rid of the thorn in our sides? <laughs> tell the truth. You're shaking. Yeah, lots of us do that. No, I know you don't do that, me. Okay. No, 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 no. But, okay. but wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm hearing this propensity to beat this poor woman up. Okay. okay? And, 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 and nobody, nobody is considering that in this woman's mind, in her mind, in her mind, she probably thinks she's been doing a hell of a job for the last 10 years. And, 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 it's, not, and it's not brought to her attention. It's not brought to her attention until after 10 years, she doesn't get this job. That's not the case. That's brought it to her. So what's real interesting 
interesting with this is how we have different perceptions. But I want to take it back to, where's the guy who brought up the four elements of EI? Thank you. When we look at this case study, the one thing that should be really apparent is that there are some deficits in each of these areas. Mm -hmm. So when we look at what's going on, there is a lack of self-awareness. Anytime you have been in an environment for a long time and gotten nowhere, something should have triggered before you're 10. And if you had these conversations with Albert and you knew <laughs> that he wasn't satisfied with these aspects of your performance, something, some light, even if it was like a little tiny 10 watt bulb, some light should have gone on somewhere in your head. The one factor that keeps us from maximizing our strengths and from having a high level of self-awareness is denial. When we tell ourselves that we are exceptional at something we're only marginal at. When we tell ourselves that I am a thought leader, and you haven't read a book in a year. <laughs> okay. When we tell ourselves those kind of things, yes? Um, I think this is, might be where you're going. But I had a question. On the slide, you have them bulleted. But on the paper, you have them one through four. So are you indicating that it's like a pyramid that in order to have the self-management, you have to have self-awareness first? You know, that they kind of compound on each other? Or can you have social skill and not have self-awareness? OK. There are multiple schools of thought on that. I believe that they blend and that they just kind of coalesce together. I don't believe that much in life really is that linear, um, except you're born and you're gonna die, okay? <laughs> Those two things are linear. <laughs> One came before the other, okay? But they blend, and my own personal belief, and you will find theorists who don't agree with Smuckle, my own personal belief is that this is the starting point, that if you don't have self-awareness, you can't accomplish much else. Okay, that without that, that foundation, that linchpin, you're going nowhere fast. So, all right, want to move on to, so what do you see as the root causes of her issues, or his issues, or their issues? <laughs> <laughs> what do you see as the real root causes? Fixed ideas. Fixed ideas. You think they're a little stuck? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> think they're a little stuck. Uh-huh. What else? And that, 
So there are multiple root causes, but when we are in our own dilemmas in the workplace, it's really important to spend some time figuring out how to get here. How to get here? Because I played a role in getting here. I didn't just get here by osmosis. I did something to get to this dilemma. And do I have some strengths that will help me move away from here? Sometimes moving away from here means moving away from the organization. Sometimes it means moving to a different place in the organization. Sometimes it means really changing what I bring with me to fit better in the organization. But I've got to do the assessment work to identify what are the strengths that I bring that will help me here. I want to move to the action plan. Who has an action plan that they want to share with us? Yes. Have a different action plan that we've not heard. 
Yes, I see a hand up way over there in the hinterlands. That's in Vancouver, isn't it? Really carefully. 
I want you to trade, and I mean exactly trade positions. Your feet are going to be where your partner's feet are, with your partner. <laughs> Hey, have you traded positions? Everybody in, in their partner's exact other position? Yes. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I know, isn't it weird? Um, now, I want you to, for the next 30 seconds, silently focus on something in the room. I'd like for you to jot down the details of what you focused on that time. Now I'd like for you to share with your partner what you focused on and vice versa. I have questions for you. Did any of you focus on the exact same thing, the exact same way? You did? Same thing, same way? How many of you? About 10% of us. And the rest of us focused on different things. Those of you who focused on the exact same thing, what was it? Hmm? The sign. Somebody else, what did you say? The occupancy sign. Uh-huh. Slide, keystone. Slide and? Keystone. 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 Fantasizing about that trip. Margaret, I think you got a lot more. Okay? Yes? The camera. The camera. Because you want to be a star. He is a star. He is a star. Because he is a star. Okay? Somebody else who focused on the same thing? Fire alarm. Fire alarm and wallpaper. And wallpaper. People who focused on different things. Tell us what you focused on. My necklace. I didn't have this necklace on yesterday. <laughs> what else? Yes.
with different experiences, and it's okay. As leaders, it is critical that we understand the multiple strengths that exist in the workplace and the different standpoints that people represent. It's equally as important to understand that there's not a lot of right and wrong in this. There's a lot of what you experience and how it plays out. So now, you gotta get a divorce from your partner and go back to your seat. <laughs> yes? Just one question before we move on. Sure. What does research tell us about the folks, the 10% or so, that saw the same vision from both perspectives? <laughs> Because <laughs> 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 seriously, standpoint theory says that we don't. That, in fact, we're all experiencing something different. And I, I would imagine that if we probed deeper with them, we would find out that they focus in general in the same area, but that the specifics that they jotted down were very different. That's what I would guess. Okay? Yes? Um, could you ask the question of the crowd, did everyone choose an inanimate object or did anyone describe a person? I was looking at you and that girl in the green dress. So I can tell you, you that green dress is really cute. Uh -huh. The green, are the dress is a thing? <laughs> between learned skills and actual innate talents. Now, going back to the theories behind this, <laughs> the theories would tell us that there really isn't, that they have both become such a part of us that they are us. So, okay? So, somebody tell us one of your talents. In the back, one of your talents. This is your opportunity to brag. Yes, my partner. Organization. Organization and Ronnie. Oh, uh, talking and interacting with people. I'm talking and interacting with people. Somebody else, what are your talents? Hmm? Shopping. Shopping? That's one of my talents too. Promotion. Promotion. Ability to remember details. Ability to remember details. Somebody else, yes. Planning great parties and get togethers. Planning great parties and get togethers. My uh-huh. Somebody else? Having fun. Having fun. Having fun. Somebody else, one of your talents, yes. I'm a baker. You're a baker. How cool is that? Somebody else along the wall, one of your talents. Yes. Problem solving. So, step one in adopting a strength-based attitude and strength-based aptitudes is being able and willing to identify our talents and to talk about them. There is a difference be talk between talking about them and bragging. And we get confused and think that if I talk about something I'm good at, it means I'm an egomaniac. It does not necessarily mean that, unless you are that. Okay, 
and the people who are that don't even think they are that. So. <laughs> the first step in this process is to figure out, to discuss what are my talents? What are the gifts that God gave me that he didn't give somebody else? So what is my unique array of gifts and talents? What does that look like for me? It's important that I be comfortable with them, that I not shy away from what is uniquely me, that I not feel like I have to assimilate so much that I lose sight of me. It's important that I am comfortable enough to kind of wallow in them and, and revel in what I have. Then the next step in this process is, what is the investment that I'm willing to make in my talent? Because raw talent is not a strength. There is some work that happens that makes the strength emerge. So what am I willing to invest in it? Somebody, what did you decide that you are willing to invest or what have you already invested in a talent? Time. What kind of time? Now, what does that mean? Time's not sufficient. What kind of time? What does that mean? Training. So training and education. What else are you willing to invest or have you invested? What else are you willing to invest or have you invested? Is it John? Yeah. Tell me. Uh, well, mine was promotion, which is, by that I meant like promoting ideas or concepts. And uh, what, what I actually did uh, last year, I created a, uh, we needed to raise money for our fire department, so I created a fireman's venture race. So it was a successful event, we're doing it again this year. Okay. Uh, and I was the one who went out and promoted it, got sponsors, and did all that. Okay. Somebody else, what are you willing to invest? Yes. Money. Money. Yeah, it's <laughs> important. Uh, I do a lot of volunteer work because service is very, very important to me. And I'm a big believer that don't talk about how much you care about the homeless. Write a check. <laughs> to the food bank, write a check to Bridges to Housing Stability. I'm on the board. We're right up in Murray right. County. Okay, <laughs> I'll take checks. <laughs> so there are all kinds of investment. Okay, investments fall into a few categories. One is the the sweat investment of actually doing something physically to work on a talent. The other investment is a mental investment of being engaged mentally in learning, in growing, in thinking, those kinds of things. There are other investments, the financial investment. The other investment in terms of doing or of service, of action. But you will notice that investments require you to do something besides talk. You know, just talking about your talent is not going to help you grow it. It's not going to solidify it so that it becomes a strength. So the investment piece is a critical component. And investment may or may not be easy. It may be easy, but it may not be easy. It fits here, so I will. I want to talk a little bit about a personal investment. I have been a walker for many, many, many years. I love walking and I love riding my bike. Those are my favorite forms of exercise. And as a result, I should also say that I'm not a stretcher. So I will go out and walk for an hour and a half and not stretch before, during, or after. As a result of that, this band of muscles, the ITB, on me, especially on the right side, feels like this a lot. So when I went to the doctor, not too long ago, I was saying, Dr. Carlson, this thing it just it pulls, it's tight all the time. She says, are you stretching? I said, no. She says, you know, if you stretched, it wouldn't pull so much. It wouldn't be so tight. Mm -hmm. A couple months later, I had to see her again. I said, Dr. Carlson, it's me the muscle. She says, are you stretching? I said, no. <laughs> I go to the, I, I have a, the most wonderful massage therapist, and I go to these 90 minute deep tissue massages. I said, Sandy, it's, it's still tight. She says, have you stretched? <laughs> I said, no, just rub it out real good, stretch it for me. Well, at the end of July, I, was, I had finished up a session, 
uh, for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I'm walking through the Philadelphia airport, and it was like this band was on fire. Uh, it just, it was so tight, and I'm just walking slowly. Now, when I pick up my pace, like I'm walking outside, it doesn't bother me at all. But if I'm walking like a normal person in an airport, it's tight. So I made up my mind that day, I am not going to keep dealing with this. I'm going to start yoga. Because yoga is all about stretching, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I started yoga the next day. I went to the Columbia Yoga Center, and I went for my first yoga class. And it was really cool. I liked it. So much so that I went the next day for my second yoga class. <laughs> and the second day, we're doing this very strange thing. It's <laughs> 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 back, and your arms are supposed to be out, and something's supposed to happen, you're supposed to be able to get down. And I got stuck. <laughs> and when I tell you I got stuck, I mean stuck. All six feet, 110 pounds of me, stuck. And the other 110 companion pounds. <laughs> so I'm looking around the room, and everybody is in the correct pose except me. So I'm feeling really uncomfortable now. And you know how you get that I'm going to cry feeling? You know that feeling? Oh, you know that feeling. Even men get that feeling. <laughs> So I'm getting the I'm going to cry feeling, and I'm saying to myself, do not cry. Do not cry. Do not cry. You're just stuck. You're not dead. Do not cry. <laughs> well, the instructor notices that I'm stuck. And her little auditing instructor notices that I'm stuck. So they come over to me. And you know how graceful yoga people move. So they glide across the room <laughs> to my little corner where I'm stuck. And by now, the tears have started, because I am painfully embarrassed about the fact that I'm stuck, that everybody can do it except me. And inside, I've got this conversation going on in my head. Why haven't you been stretching for years? It's your own damn fault that you're stuck. You stuck yourself here. You should have practiced before you left home, and then you wouldn't be embarrassed. So I have this conversation in my head. The instructor comes over. She thinks because I'm crying that I'm in pain. And she's like, oh, Jalan, you're in pain. She's an Indian lady. You're in pain. You're in pain. I said, no. And now I'm laughing because she thinks I'm in pain. I said, no, I'm not in pain. I'm in embarrassment. <laughs> so I continue to be crying and laughing at the same time. <laughs> and I am so convinced that she thinks I'm schizophrenic. Okay? <laughs> so they help me get out of the position. And I get out of the position and get to whatever the next position is, sort of. And at the end of the class, the funniest thing happened. There's a lot of older ladies in, in Yoga One, and uh, they're really fit and agile. So this lady, who's got to be 75, comes up to me when I'm rolling up my mat and says, oh, no, ma'am, I'm going to get that for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, not only are you stuck, but now people think you're Jerry the tree. <laughs> The process for building on a talent, for making the investment, is not necessarily going to be easy. There are going to be times where you feel like I felt in yoga, like, oh my god, everyone can do this except me. Everybody can do this except me. Where you feel awkward, where you feel uncomfortable. But I believe that the growth and the strength comes from pushing past that. I was so thrilled, two weeks ago, I could do the downward dog. <laughs> it's taken all of August and all of September, but this puppy can go down. <laughs> and it is through that persistent effort that we come to develop strengths. But, it is also through a couple of other things. It's about the connections that we make and having the right people in our corner. I have done the yoga at the Columbia Yoga Center faithfully when I'm home. Every day if I'm home, I'm going to go to a class. Well, one day I slept through the class because I had been traveling. So I said, well, just go to yoga at the Y. You belong to the Y. It's free. You've got to be in the right yoga place. Mm -hmm. Yoga at the Y is a really different experience than yoga at the yoga center. 
And what it reminded me of is that in order to be vulnerable, you have to be safe. I never got comfortable in the yoga at the Y class because the instructor came in, she never met the new students, she didn't tell us her name, she just started, and we're doing all this stuff, and I'm like, slow it down, lady, we didn't even have our meditation time. We need meditation to do all this, my body doesn't do this without some prayer. <laughs> selective about your surroundings and selective about that investment and who you're going to make it with because you want to make the investment with people who are of like minds. Now they don't have to think exactly like you. They can have a different standpoint, but there has to be a core that is similar. Something else. Sometimes we are on the teaching end. And we've got to think about how we're teaching. Am I teaching in a way that enables people to identify their strengths? Am I leading in a way that encourages people to bring their strengths to work? Am I leading in a way that really engages people and welcomes their distinctness and their difference? Because when we start looking at this whole strength-based leadership and how we lead with our strengths, none of us have the exact same strengths. I grew up in a very musical family. My sisters sing like angels. I can't carry a tune. And I'm tone deaf. Mm -hmm. Because even though we came from the same mama and the same papa, <coughs> even though we looked alike, if they walked in the room, you know they're her sisters. We're different. So when we start looking at people in the workplace, it's really important that we help them find and figure their strengths. And then, as much as possible, create room for those strengths. Now the reality of life is this. We are not going to be able to create room for every strength. And, and this is when we have the honest conversations with people about finding the right environment because this may not be the right environment. When we look at that case study, one of the things that's really clear, and this is actually someone that is a coaching client, was a coaching client of mine, it was never the right environment for her. She stayed and did the work, but the truth of the matter is, it never was a good fit. Had kind of a, a distressing conversation with a person in St. Louis this week. She pulled me aside after the session and said, you know, I really just do not like this nonprofit that I work for. Um, I don't get along well with my boss. I, I don't support the mission of the organization, but I've been here seven years. I was like, okay. <laughs> she says, um, so what do you think? I said that you need to go someplace else for the next seven years. <laughs> and she's like, but what if it's worse? I said, but what if it's better? You know, freeing people to understand that this is not the only game in town is really important. It is very, very, very important that we help people go in the direction that their natural strengths lead them. If you've never done it, I strongly recommend the book, Strength-Based Leadership, and the assessment tool that goes along with it. It is an excellent, excellent, excellent tool. There's also an article, I can't remember the author. It's a uh, Harvard Business Review article called How to Play to Your Strengths. If you want it, write it on the back of your business card and I'll email it to you because I can't remember the, the correct citation. Um, but they're both really good tools for getting us started reflecting on our best selves. And what strength-based leadership asks us to do is simply to reflect on and to embrace my very best self. Well, it is time for me to start wrapping this baby up in time to wrap up. <laughs> we started the process by laying a firm foundation in emotional intelligence, by hopefully coming to a good understanding about the fact that we all come here differently, but there are some key skills that we must cultivate 
to succeed in leadership, and emotional intelligence is really one of those key skills. It asks us to think about how do we persist in the midst of frustration. It asks us to think seriously about cultivating four key areas. The first one being self-awareness, the ability to make your own hair do and don't worry about mine. <laughs> and self-management, the capacity to control oneself and to control one's emotions and to really lead in a way that brings people into the fold instead of pushing them out. And then this concept moves us to this idea that it's not enough to just work on me. I have to have some social awareness. I have to understand the complexity and the diversity of today's workforce. I have to understand that everybody doesn't look like me. Everybody doesn't think like me. But everybody comes here with a different standpoint. That we may be in the same organization, doing the same work in the same department, but we see it very differently, and we experience it very differently. And then the last of those components is a real important piece, and that is all about the social skill. It's about what I do or not to engage people. What do I do to get people excited and on fire for this organization and its mission? Can I get people to line up to come to Columbus, Ohio? Can I get people excited about freezing in Vancouver in the winter? <laughs> I'm excited. You're going to have a Nordstrom. I'm going to have warm clothes. She's going to buy me boots, okay? Can I, can I get people to want to see what in the world is in Keystone, Colorado? Do I, do I get people excited about those things? Because if I didn't bring my own excitement, I can't expect other people to have it. So as we continue to work on this emotional intelligence, what we came to understand is that it is an integral component of strength-based leadership. What we come to understand is that we each come to the table with talents in which we must invest. The talent alone is not enough. It is the investment the consistent work on that talent that yields the strength. And the investment process is not necessarily going to be easy. There will be moments where you're stuck, where it's embarrassing, where you look like an idiot and you feel like one too. <laughs> and rightfully so, okay? And rightfully so. But the question is, will the view be worth the climb? And I believe it will. I believe that when we find what is really clicking within us, we become more comfortable with the self. And when we are more comfortable with the self, we can be more comfortable with others. Now, a couple of questions came up at the beginning. One of the questions is the definition. We've covered the definition. But somebody said, I think we should be drinking. Is this a fad or is it real? It is what you make it. It is what you make it. If you decide that it is going to be real for you, it will. If you decide, she was entertaining, that was a lovely lady that <laughs> night, then that's what it'll be. So it, it depends on how deeply you want to go with this. If you want to go deep and you want more resources, I'm happy, 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 happy to send them to you. Another question that came up is, I can't read my writing, even with my glasses on. How do we identify strengths? And the Strengths Finder 2.0 or the Strength Based Leadership are the best tools that I know of. There is another activity called Reflected Best Self that is a wonderful way, it's a facilitated experience called Reflected Best Self, that is a wonderful way to begin to identify your strengths. Can you have it at any level? Well, it should be really apparent that you can and that you should be working as a leader on cultivating it throughout your team and on cultivating it people at all levels in the organization. 
The last question came up through an activity that we were doing. How do you figure out your weaknesses and can you turn them into strengths? One of the things that I think is awesome about this strength-based approach, which is actually rooted in something called positive psychology, is that it doesn't worry about your weaknesses. Because the theory is simply this. If you are playing to your strengths, that will compensate for the areas in which you perceive yourself to be deficient. And if you are not focusing on the areas in which you perceive yourself to be deficient, they come to matter less. So, as we wrap this up, I'd like for you to just think about what you're willing to take and use. And make a commitment to actually taking it and using it. You have been wonderful. I appreciate you working and playing with me this evening. I hope that you will have found just one thing that you are willing to take and use the heck out of it. Thank you very much.